How's everybody doing? Good, good. It's good to be here today. Hey, I am a huge fan of your church. I've got to hang around Lou and the team for a number of years now, and it's been really cool to see what God is doing here. Um, I am from northern Indiana. It's actually northwest Indiana. I wore a map for you today, if that's, if that's helpful. We're up here, the dot in the corner, which is actually the suburbs of Chicago. And, you know, every time I think about your church, it just kind of jumps off the page to me how excited I am. I got to come last summer and uh, spend a weekend with you. It's always nice to be invited to one of our new churches and get to speak. But you know what's really nice is to be invited back to speak again. It's, it's a great thing. So I am... Totally, totally thrilled to be here. And like Lou said, our church started 26, 27 years ago, and I was there, you know, right at the beginning stages. And we've seen God do amazing things, but I never want to forget about those early days when there's early vision and all kinds of new people coming and like having experience with church for the first time. And we decided when we were really young that people were generous, that churches were generous with us and invested in us, that we were going to do the same thing for other churches. So actually, now that God's blessed us, um, in the last five years, our church has helped about 15 new churches get started. And uh, listen, a little secret, you're my favorite, right? And I don't say that to everybody. Um, I just say it to the people who invite me back to speak a second time. Um, now, what do I love about your church? Well, I love that there's healthy leadership here, which of course starts with Lou, right? Did you know, did you know... We can clap. There's a lot to celebrate. You can clap all the time. But I've been telling Lou for three years, I love your hair, man. I wish my hair was like your hair. Little did I know he wanted hair like my hair. It's beautiful, beautiful. But you get a leader who has integrity and vision and a commitment to the local area that they're in. And then a guy who can build a great team. I mean, the staff here is amazing. And the volunteer team, when I walk in today to see the energy of people who are serving to make all of this happen, it's just amazing to me. So I love seeing a good, healthy church. But it's, it is more than just good leadership. I've seen the hand of God on community church, right? It's beautiful to see how he's provided at just the right time in really mysterious and beautiful ways. I don't want anyone ever to miss that the hand of God is part of this. And then always part of the mix is the generosity of a church. And when I hear Lou describe that community church, just two and a half years old, is already being generous to help other new churches get started, I'm like, man, this, this is the dream for me. I want to invest in churches and help with leadership until they can be supporting themselves and have their own leadership and be starting their own new churches. So all that to say, I'm thrilled to be here. My wife and I, we have four kids, 22, 18, 16, and three. Yeah, three always gets the wow. It's, it's always interesting. My 22-year-old is in the Marines. He's stationed at Camp Pendleton in California. My 18-year-old son was with me last year when I came. My 16-year-old daughter is with me today, so Abby's thrilled to be on a trip to New York with her dad. That's awesome. But my three-year-old, he always gets the wow. And I got to tell you this, our three-year-old, you know, if you have a three-year-old or if you can even remember that stage, our three-year-old brings the most energy to our house and consumes the most energy in our house all at the same time. And he's at the stage where he's starting to talk and he's starting to use, isn't it funny when little kids start to use adult phrases, especially when they put them in the right context? One of the things Davion says, he says, oh, I almost forgot. Oh, I almost forgot. And he usually uses it in the right place. So like we're at breakfast and he's having his breakfast, but he didn't eat his vitamin yet. He's like, oh, I almost forgot. And then, you know, when he goes to bed at night, he has a little alarm clock. If he forgets to set the alarm clock, he's like, oh, I almost forgot. Now, some of you are thinking, your three-year-old has an alarm clock. I know that's what you're thinking. But if you haven't had a three-year-old for a while, things have changed. This is not an alarm clock to wake him up in the morning. This is an alarm clock that turns green when it's okay for him to get out of bed. And it is the most glorious invention that happened between my older kids and my youngest one. But I like to take Davey on to our local YMCA. We'll go swimming, we'll you know, walk on the track, do those sorts of things. Well, at our YMCA, maybe you have this around here, there's a place in the hallway where you can give feedback. You can push a button for you know, happy face or sad face. Did, did the workers do a good job? Davion loves to go up to it and push the happy face, which makes all the workers at the YMCA really happy also. But uh, a few weeks ago, we were at the swimming pool and we came back to the locker room getting changed. He pulls off his swimming trunks as fast as he can. He's totally naked. And he wants to go out in the hallway 
to go hit the button, right? And I'm like, Davion, Davion, you got to get dressed first. He's like, oh, I almost forgot. That's <laughs> so wild. But I think about, you know, forgetting things and remembering things, you know, at, at this stage of life, it's a little different game. And so to do a series called Throwbacks is just awesome to me because what we're doing during this series is we're thinking back actually to memories that I think God wanted to establish with his people. You know, all kinds of things happened before Jesus came to earth, but they're not all recorded in the Old Testament for us. But some of these stories, they're just amazing. And as as we've been talking about, these stories are actually the stories Jesus would have heard as he was growing up. Now, there's one particular verse from the Old Testament that I think kind of captures all of this. Maybe you've heard this verse before. It's from the book of Deuteronomy. It says, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now, choose life so that you and your children may live. Now, you think about these stories that are recorded in the Old Testament, and a lot of them are life and death stories. There's a high drama to them. And when choices are being made, of course, we get to see them in retrospect and be like, wow, if that of a different choice had been made, it could have gone a totally different direction. And the encouragement, all of us, is to choose life. And this is what's so interesting to me, so that you and your children may live. And it's one of the things I think is worth thinking about, that while these Old Testament stories we see in hindsight They're actually the same stories that you and I live every day. And I'm not sure choices present themselves as life or death, as that dramatic in real time, in the moment, but they really are. I have a buddy, a guy I have a lot of respect for. He's just a little bit older than me, so he has kids in his 20s and his dad in his 70s. And this friend of mine, he was telling me once that um, his dad, you know, was kind of a hard man. He tried to teach him the right thing, But his dad's dad was a man who had trouble with alcohol and had kind of walked out on his family, been absent most of the time, abusive some of the time. And my buddy, who's who's just a little older than me, he said, a few years ago, my dad came to me and he said, son, I haven't done the perfect job raising you and I have a fair number of regrets but I've done better than my dad did. And I pray that you'll do better than I do with your sons. And I think, man, you get a story like that and you understand how choices that get made affect your children and your grandchildren and all these choices. They're just everyday choices to us, but they happen in real time. So today, we're going to look at a story from the Old Testament. It's actually a continuation of the story of David, which I know you've looked at over the last couple weeks because I watch your services online. It's awesome. So a couple weeks ago, Lou was talking about David and Goliath, and last week, Tom was talking about this wonderful kind of dynamic instance where David had the chance to kill Saul but didn't. And next in the storyline of David is the story of David and Bathsheba. And maybe you've heard this story before. Maybe you've heard the part about David and Bathsheba um, I, I'm always interested thinking about Jesus listening to this story as a child, how parents would tell their children the story of David and Bathsheba. If you don't know it, we're going to get to it in a moment. But it's more than David and Bathsheba. It's also David and Uriah, and it's David and Nathan. And maybe before I dive into the story, it's helpful to think about the framework of it, because the storyline here is a common storyline, not just for their lives, but I think in all of our lives as well. Tell me you haven't seen the storyline play out for you or people that you know. First comes temptation. And then temptation might become rebellion. And if you fall into this rebellion, it might become redemption. And in some ways, if you get all the way through redemption, this can be a beautiful story. But let's pull it apart just for a moment because all of us face temptation, right? Temptation is just this impulse inside of us to do something we know isn't right. It might be an internal impulse or it might be an external impulse where someone else is trying to get us to do something. A lot of times, a lot of times, can we just be honest about this? It's the the idea that I'm trying to feel good. And if I'm a little bit tired or a little bit angry or a little bit frustrated or a little bit like I deserve it, then that instinct to 
have a good feeling, oh, it's very, very strong. That is the nature of temptation. One of the biggest temptations I see, maybe you see this in your life, is when you've made a commitment to something, a promise or a vow, and then it's not really going like you wanted it to. There's a great temptation in American culture, for sure, just to exit that commitment, to exit that vow. But like, we're, those feelings come up inside of us. There's temptations for shortcuts, to say, oh, if I, nobody thinks I'm going to cheat a lot to benefit a little, but you get the chance to cheat a little, to benefit a lot. I mean, we are all pulled in that direction. That's what temptation is. But if you give in to temptation, it becomes rebellion. And rebellion, I mean, that's, that's wrong. Now, I don't know if you're a follower of Jesus or not. For followers of Jesus, we, we measure rebellion against the standards that God has set for us. But even if you're not a follower of Jesus, you probably don't even live up to your own standards, right? And that is rebellion. And I've been trying to create an environment at our church where especially young men, men in their 20s and 30s, can be honest about the places in their life where they're falling to sinful or rebellious things. And I notice that when people start to be authentic and start to admit, kind of come out of hiding, as the song says, bring some things into the light, it's very, very powerful. And I thought for a minute, like, maybe this is unique among guys in their 20s and 30s. But then I talked to some guys in their 50s at our church, and they're like, no, it's not just 20s and 30s. If I could be honest about the places I'm failing, like, it really changes things. And then I talked to some women at our church, and they're like, no, it's not just guys. Like, we all have this temptation that can lead to rebellion. And hopefully, if it ends up in rebellion, it leads to redemption, a new life, a cleansing, a forgiveness. But... I want us to, to pull this common storyline apart for just a few minutes today. And here's my idea, is that if you put question marks in these spots, then we start to notice that between temptation and rebellion, there's the chance to at least stop and say, oh, could something happen here so I don't have to follow through on that? And between rebellion and redemption, a lot of people stop and they don't necessarily get to redemption. So if you miss everything else, this is the whole message for today. Our choices after temptation and after rebellion are life and death choices. That's the whole point. So let's start with issue number one, that moment right after temptation. Here's how I like to think about it. Temptation is inevitable, but rebellion is actually optional. So I'm going to get to David's story here in just a moment, but... I mean, I know I'm a guest speaker, and we don't know each other personally, but I'm going to start asking you some very personal questions just over the next few moments. Nobody's going to have to raise their hand or share anything or write anything down, but I do want you to bring up these situations in your own life, so I, I wrote these down myself. Here's just eight questions I want to ask you to reflect on as we get into David's story. Question number one, what are the things that you've been doing wrong lately? I mean, beyond, beyond kind of the quick brush of, yeah, nobody's perfect, to say, no, actually, I, I mean, the Bible gives us seven deadly sins. They probably fall under greed or lust or pride or gluttony or sloth or wrath or envy. What have you been doing wrong lately? Question number two, what are the things you're thinking about doing wrong? Like you're tempted. You're considering doing them wrong. Question number three, what are the things you keep doing wrong? It's actually a habit at this stage. And you know it's not right, but it is part of life. Question number four, so where are you justifying that behavior? Which is the way it always works, right? Like, yeah, it's wrong, but you know why I did it. I have a reason, a justification for it. Here's one, question number five. What are some of the things you used to feel guilty about, but they don't even ding your conscience anymore? Like over time, you just may be able to kind of shake it off or, or dull that part of your conscience and you don't even feel it anymore. Number six. <laughs> what would you be ashamed about if it came out, if your husband found out, 
or your wife found out or your kids found out or your pastor found out? Like, is there something in life right now? I, I'm sure not everyone in the room has something like that, but I'm sure 15 people in this room have something like that. Like, ah, yeah. <laughs> Question number seven. If you're going to have an affair, do you know who it would be with? Question number eight. What do you feel like God is not delivering on for you? Because when I start to go through life and I feel like, God, you're not, you're not coming through for me. God, life's become kind of dull. God, God, I thought you were promising this and it's not there. Those become the very environments where this temptation really, really matters. So this is the story of David. David, at this point in his life, had become a hero. He had conquered Goliath. He had avoided the kind of the, the trap of selfishness of knocking off Saul. Um, at this point in David's life, Saul had now had died, and David had become king. David became king of part of the kingdom at age 30, of the whole kingdom at age 37. And by his early 40s, he had essentially conquered all the countries that were around. This was very unusual for their day, where they would go out to war all of the time. But David lived in peacetime. And it's interesting, when you think about the environments where you and I are tempted, one of the storylines out there is when you're flying high, when you're flying high, you think you got the world by the tail, there's a great risk at temptation. But let's be honest, it's not just when you're flying high. Actually, when you're feeling low, when you're feeling low and you feel like things are not as they should be, there's a great risk of temptation. And actually, when you're neither high nor low, but life just seems kind of stale. You know how this works, right? You all have a job, and your job, like it was great at first, but now it's kind of like a job, right? And a lot of you are married, and your marriage, like, I'm sure yours isn't like this, but sometimes it's like marriage. And you're raising kids, and kids are fun, and they're tiring and all that, but after a while, it doesn't sometimes feel like kids. And then this becomes life. It's like job, marriage, kids. Vacation, woo, job, marriage. And it's in those environments where we could fall to this temptation. So this is the story that happened in David's life. King, in his early 40s, says in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, it was just what they did every spring, David remained in Jerusalem. So David was king, and usually kings go off to war with their men, but this year, David didn't go. Why? I, we don't know exactly why. Maybe it's because he felt like he deserved it. That's a very common environment where temptation starts to happen. One evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. Now, maybe this was an innocent stroll, like, hey, it's a beautiful night, I'm just going to enjoy the sky. Or maybe he knew that, you know, every now and then from the roof of my palace, I can look down at the roof of another palace and see something my eyes actually like to see. Passage goes on. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Now, we can just be honest about this in this room, right? For a guy and probably for a lady, you see a beautiful woman, a beautiful man, she's naked. Like, it does something inside of you. It's not his wife. He knows that. He sees her. This is just temptation. This is the nature of real life. Your eyes come across things like that. But here's my point. At many points in David's story, before he gets to that spot between temptation and rebellion, he had the chance for an exit ramp. He could have said, you know what, I see her. Oh, I better turn away. I better walk away. I better shut this down right now. But he did not. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure he was justifying at this stage. He's like, well, I'm not going to do anything, but I mean, I'm kind of curious. Like, what could I know about her? I actually had a guy tell me once. He was married, and he said, well, just because you've already ordered doesn't mean you can't look at the menu. I'm like, you should, you, we should just pay attention to ourselves. We should just pay attention to ourselves and say, man, when I start to feel that temptation, this temptation that is inevitable, you will not escape temptation. The question is, what do I do when I'm tempted? Do I take the exit ramp, or do I keep progressing down the road. He kept progressing. Next verse. The man said, she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Ilian, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Now, Uriah was a man in David's army, 
And he's actually going to become later a central and tragic part of this story. He knew she was another man's wife. But the passage goes on. The man said, daughter of the Hittite, then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. So you have these moments between temptation and rebellion. And I'm just telling you, these are critical moments in our lives. That if you can take the exit ramps during temptation, if you can not fall to the rebellion, it really, really is a matter of life and death. Because what happens here? David gets word that Bathsheba is pregnant. He thought it was a one-night fling, and it's not going to be a one-night fling unless David has enough power to arrange certain things. Now, I know some of you are sitting there thinking right now, because I thought this the first time I read the story. I'm like, okay, what, what does David's story have to do with me? Right? David's a king. He's got a pal- I have never walked around on the top of my palace. Any of you? No? Nobody? But, but this is the point, if you can think about it like this. Almost every human being, we will do what we think we can get away with. David was king. He could get away with a lot. You may not think you can get away with that much, but almost everyone does whatever they think they can get away with. So David sends for Uriah. He's like, hey, get him back here. And David has this all arranged. He's like, I'm going to get Uriah to come back. He's going to sleep with Bathsheba. They're going to think the kid's his. Problem solved. Uriah comes back. But interestingly, Uriah has more integrity than David has. He says, David, I'm not going to go sleep with my wife. My, my friends, my brothers are out there on the battlefield. And David gets him drunk so he'll go home and sleep with his wife. But he still doesn't sleep with his wife. And so David's only option is to send Uriah back to battle and get this. David literally, literally writes a note, a memo, saying to Uriah's commander, Joab, he says, send Uriah to the front line so he'll be killed. He seals it and he hands it to Uriah for Uriah to deliver sealed to Joab. And I just think, isn't this the nature of kind of this temptation, sinful pattern in our lives? Once one thing is off, it leads to another thing and leads to another thing. It never, it never just stays where it's supposed to be in our mind. And so Uriah delivers the letter to Joab. Joab, who's a friend of David and knew David as integrity, is like, I cannot believe my friend is asking me to do this, but he's the king. And so he carries out the command and he sends Uriah out into battle, pulls the, pulls the other guys back and lets Uriah die. Now, in this case, here's what happened. It says, when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. It all started with seeing something. It all started with not, not taking the exit ramp. He ends up sleeping with Bathsheba, and now not only is Uriah dead, but other men in David's army are dead. This is collateral damage. It's exactly the way temptation works. It's why when you choose life or death, it affects you and your children. 2 Samuel also says this, the thing David did had displeased the Lord, which I think we should not throw away this verse. Some of us in the room might be motivated right now by resisting temptation because of how much it will cost us, but it's worth from time to time just remembering our reverence for God himself. And say, God, I will not do things that displease you. And then we get this. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, David. I don't have time to tell you the whole rest of the story of David. Perhaps some of you know it. But David, for his children and his children's children, created just chaos. One of his own sons rebels against him, tries to kill him. You know, he lost his family through this one act. Imagine this with me. We've been saying these are stories that Jesus heard. Well, Jesus grew up in a home with Mary and Joseph, and Jesus had a brother. His name was James. Fascinating. James didn't believe that his brother was the son of God until he saw his brother come back from the dead, and then he was all in. And later on, James would write one of the letters that we have in our New Testament. And I almost have to picture, like, James is writing this, maybe thinking about the story of David, David and Bathsheba, that he sat next to Jesus listening to his mom and dad tell. And here's what James says. It's, it's a helpful outline for all of us. 
He says, each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And I'm just asking all of you right now, if there's a temptation in your life and this is the storyline, to say, you have, you have the power of a decision. Evil never presents itself as evil. It's desirable. It's enticing. I have a pastor friend. It's kind of a weird saying, but he's like, hey, if you're sinning and it's not fun, you're doing it wrong. Because it appears desirable. It's enticing. But then, after the desire has been conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And so hear me, temptation is inevitable, rebellion is optional, there's a life or death choice, and I'm asking you to exit now. I believe every time I stand on a platform and I teach the Word of God that there's the chance that God would do something in someone's heart that changes the direction of their life. And if you're sitting there right now and you think, man, I've been thinking, of, I've been thinking about doing this wrong, today is the day to exit because it leads to death. You think, are people going to die? Well, here's what I know. When it comes out, It kills the relationship. It kills your integrity. It kills the dreams that you had for your life. And some people are in a situation right now where you have the chance to exit. I pray that you will. But what if it's too late to exit? What if the place you are in this common storyline right now isn't between temptation and rebellion and you have the chance to avoid all that destruction? What if you'd say, if we're all being honest in the room right now, like, Greg, I've already done it. I'm in the midst of rebellion right now. And then what? Well, this story has something to say to that also. Because rebellion is actually universal. You don't fall to every temptation that you have, but everyone falls to something. That's one of the things the scriptures teach us, and it should be humbling to all of us. And while rebellion is universal, redemption is accessible. And I use this word accessible very intentionally. What I mean is redemption is not automatic. Not everyone who goes through rebellion ends up with redemption. A lot of people end up in very dark spots for the rest of their lives. There is no cleansing. There is no new life. There's nothing beautiful. But it is possible. Jesus told the story in Luke 15 of a father whose son rebelled and walked away. And the posture of the father, he's trying to get us to see who God is. The posture of the father is that he's waiting on his porch, hoping that his son will come home. And some of you have had this story in your own family, like I have in my extended family, where there's literally a dad who's standing 100 feet away from a burned-out building when his son is doing meth in the building. And the dad just wants his son to come home. Oh. Yes, you've made the wrong choice. Yes, it's developed into rebellion. Yes, things are dying right now. But that does not have to be the end of the story. And I promise you, it does not have to be the end of your story. And actually, when you look at the story of David, it shifts from a narrative of 2 Samuel to one of the Psalms. I don't know if you've ever read the Psalms or if you even know why the Psalms were written. The Psalms are essentially a diary. They are a picture into the unvarnished, unfiltered, uncensored feelings of the people who are writing them. And David wrote most of them. Interestingly, one of the things the Psalms do is they give us language that we ourselves can use in prayer. I, I don't know if you know this, but when Jesus was walking into Jerusalem, kind of the high moment a week before he ended up on the cross, the, the people were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Where did they get that? Well, they got it from the Psalms. And then when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says one of the most striking things, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where did Jesus get that language? Well, it comes from the Psalms, Psalm 22. 
It's actually just language for us that we can use in our own lives at our lowest points. And Psalm 51 gets this heading. It says, For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So Nathan was a true friend to David. You know, Oscar Wilde said, true friends stab you in the front. (laughs) They tell you the truth, and they try to get you on course. And Nathan did that with his friend David. He said, what you did is not right. He actually had to tell him a story so that he could see it himself. And then David came to this moment where he had experienced rebellion, and the question was, but will you experience redemption? And this is what David writes in Psalm 51. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. And these words that David wrote that are unvarnished and unfiltered and uncensored are available to each one of us today. You know, it's so interesting to me, and maybe this would shift for you based on the relationship with you, that you had with your dad, but you know, there's, there's one group of people who would say, oh, I messed up. I hope my dad doesn't find out. And there's a whole other group of people that say, oh, I messed up. I need to call my dad. And the image of our heavenly father is that he is that second father that you can come to and say, God, I messed up. The passage goes on. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I don't know what your habits of confession are for the things that you've done wrong. I think in a healthy person's life, here's what you have. You have an everyday habit of confession where you can just stop and say, God, I I didn't do this right today. It's usually small things day after day. Maybe every six months or in an emergency, you have a session like this that just says, God, I screwed up. Would you create in me a clean heart? and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And then David says this, you don't delight in sacrifice or I'd bring it to you. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. What's David saying here? He's like, he's like God, I know this isn't quid pro quo. I know this isn't transactional. I know this isn't, I did something wrong so I can send you some money and we'll be fine, right? David's like, no, I can come, I'm the king. I can sacrifice animal after animal after animal. That's not what you're interested in. My sacrifice, oh God, is a broken spirit, broken and contrite heart that God, you will not despise. And so, if in this common storyline of temptation and then rebellion and then redemption, you are at the spot of rebellion, this is the invitation. There is cleansing. There's a fresh start and a new life. And actually, John, a friend of Jesus, wrote it like this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. And he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so in just a minute, I'm going to pray And then we're going to listen to a song, perhaps sing a song together. And my whole image of this weekend while I was praying about it was to pray, God, if there are people in front of me who are in the midst of rebellion right now, to let them know they can choose life. What did Moses say in Deuteronomy? He said, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live.